Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. While things do look uh, grim here in Australia, uh, coronavirus-wise, economically and culturally, particularly here in Victoria, spare a thought for the British. Uh, Great Britain is in the midst of probably its biggest cultural and identity crisis, a crisis that has been brewing uh, since the collapse of the British Empire following the Second World War. Britain's coronavirus lockdown and the police enforcement was the most draconian in the Western world, which kept native Britons under house arrest. But internationally the borders remained open but this lockdown was not enforced against britain's uh, cultural uh, black lives matter protesters who have also moved on to demanding historical statues being taken down nationalists in britain face their biggest uphill battle to save the nation as they know it and are up against the entire political media and global establishment who are out to demonize and destroy them so how did britain arise arrive in this grim situation. My guest tonight will shed some light upon the current state of British nationalism and if the current neo-Marxist postmodernist trend in the nation can be reversed. Nick Griffin was the face of British nationalism at the turn of the 21st century. He was chairman of the British National Party from 1999 to 2014 and was elected a member of the European Parliament in 2009 for Northwest England, serving until 2014. Uh, the British National Party has experienced a decline this past decade. UKIP uh, became the party of choice for many British nationalist voters at local and European elections, but UKIP in 2020 is now also uh, in decline. Nick still contributes to public debate by his Twitter account and Telegram channel, and I'm grateful that he has decided to join us tonight on Wilmsfront. Uh, Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. Uh, now, it's, uh, I, I hope you don't mind me mentioning your your age, but you're in your your sixties now. Uh, you're a, just, a, just. Ve- a veteran of the the British nationalist uh, movement, and you joined uh, what, the 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 movement in your in your teens when yeah. uh, that was the the beginning of the 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 mass migration wave to to, to the UK, and when you joined uh, the uh, probably the you'd call it the 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 the, the first uh, uh, nationwide nationalist group, the the National Front. So, what did you see at the time on the ground in the early seventies, and what you know, inspired you to to become involved and dedicate the rest of your life uh, to the cause? Well, I was brought up in a very political household, um, very right wing conservatives. Uh, I remember the well, I was only nine at the time. The excitement over the speech made by Enoch Powell, who's the first mainstream uh, figure, in fact, more or less the only mainstream figure, to warn about the impact of mass immigration. And although it was, as he said, only the size of a, a cloud the size of a man's hand, uh, it was very obvious to people who were political on our wavelength that uh, this was something the role would become a very serious problem. But I joined the National Front actually not so much about the immigration issue, that was, that was very important. It was actually over the issue of communism. Uh, and in the, the, the early to middle 1970s in Britain, there was an assumption by pretty much everyone who was highly political, from the far left of the trade unions right through to the, uh, the conservative far right, that Britain was heading on the same road as Finland, uh, whereby we were increasingly going to become a, a Soviet satellite. Uh, and the, the threat of the, the Red Army crashing through the door with, uh, with the help of um, a homegrown fifth column was regarded as a very real serious threat. Uh, the Conservative Party seemed content just to, whenever they got into power, to mark time uh, to do nothing to push back against this. So I joined the National Front because they were the people who, on the streets, were continually attacked physically by the far left as well as verbally and so on. And when they were attacked, they fought back, which appealed to me. Yes, you've reminded me that in the early 70s in the UK, well, that was when the, the, the trade unions were constantly on, tri- on strike. There was the, the three-day working week uh, where you could only get electricity certain days of the week. Yes, yeah, that, I did my, uh, my O-levels uh, when I was 15, 16, uh, literally by candlelight, night after night. It was a, ve- a very strange time, uh, and although obviously it passed, at the time, we all thought, well, this is probably it. It's really serious. 
Now, obviously, in the 70s and 80s, uh, there was no, uh, well, no internet, let alone social media. Mm. And so political organizations, uh, parties, uh, it, it, the way that they got their, their message out was through letterboxing, distributing uh, literature, and also having to depend on the, the mainstream media uh, for exposure. And that was around about the time, the 70s and 80s, when the, the media moguls were uh, being born and uh, owning uh, a, a lot of the, the, the newspapers and other regional outlets. Uh, can you describe activism, uh, nationalist activism in that time? Yeah, as you say, it's in incredibly different to what we've, I won't say we've got now because censorship is pushing us back to the same sort of thing, online censorship. But it's incredibly different to how things were, say, three or four years ago, uh, before Charlottesville and before the clampdown. Uh, hugely differently. The most important weapon for uh, a lad of 15 or 16 and all my mates uh, in the party calls for stickers. And we put up thousands of sticker stickers um, adorning thousands of um, lampposts, uh, the far left, first the International Socialists, then the Socialist Workers Party. Uh, they also produced stickers, anti-fascist stickers, and we had, anyway, you went regularly. Uh, you had a, a war with activists from the other side that you never saw. Of taking down each other's stickers and plastering your own on top of them. Then, as you say, there was leaflets, door-to-door uh, -door paper selling in areas where the, the local organiser was particularly on the ball and had some real initiative. Um, it was very much trying to get small quantities of the printed word out while the mass media, as you say, already in the hands of the moguls, invariably ignored you and would only ever cover you if it was in a way that could do you damage. That was in the the Charter of the National Union of Journalists, which is one of the most left-wing of all trade unions. Uh, so we really had an uphill battle uh, even to be seen, let alone to be heard. Now, the, the, the National Front, it was, origin, it was both an organisation and also a political party. Uh, in the, the 80s, the, the British National Party, which you led uh, for 15 years, uh, was, was founded. The original leader of the British National Party was also the original leader of the, the National Front, uh, John Tyndall, who is now uh, deceased. He was openly white nationalist um and it was easy for the the mainstream media in the early days to to paint or well, st uh, still to this day the national front and uh the british national party as a a fascist organization i'll first ask you to comment on uh, who obviously you worked with john tyndall for many years who you uh, thought he was and uh those uh, early uh, uh perceptions and associations of the National Front and the British National Party? Well, the um, National Front was formed in 1967-68 uh, by a group of people. Actually, John Tyndall recommended that his followers join it, but he wasn't actually even allowed in to start with. It was founded by a group of men generally who had uh, direct involvement in the Second World War. Uh, its first governing body was absolutely packed with war heroes. Uh, several decorated RAF men and so on. Uh, A.K. Chesterton, the founder, uh, had fought in the First and the Second World War for Britain, although he'd also been a member of uh, most of the British Union fascists. Uh, but Tyndall stayed out because they thought he was too extreme, because uh, John and various of the others who later became key in the National Front had gone through uh, various movements, including the National Socialist Movement in Britain, which you have to say was monumentally stupid. Uh, this was at a time when any, not even old man, any young to middle-aged man in those very early days was a veteran of the Second World War. Uh, and every woman in the street in a house you knocked on uh, in London had been bombed in the Second World War. Uh, so to hitch your, to hitch your, uh, your wagon with a, with, with a Nazi symbol was really absolutely insane. But having said that, John Tyndall had immense, he was actually a British patriot. Uh, he had an argument once with... Um, uh, John jo with Johnny Jordan, who was the main of the real Nazis, uh, and John said, well, if we're going to have a swastika, at least make it a red, white and blue swastika. <laughs> still, it's still insane, but you can see he genuinely was a British patriot, there's no doubt about it. And he was also a man, for all his faults, of immense drive and determination and relentless self-discipline. And I don't think there's anyone else I've ever met or almost even heard of who could have effectively found, effectively found it because he really did create the big BNF as it was once he took it over. 
he could have effectively founded and then built and run two political parties the Mint's drive and i was saying although we had clashes later on when you know it's uh, two, two alpha top dogs vying for the top position it's never going to end particularly well but i always had, also always had a great deal of respect for john tindall uh, his book the 11th hour is still worth reading as a sort of snapshot of uh, how uh, the far right in Britain developed uh, and what its people thought. Uh, and uh, he's a man, he was in the end hounded to death by the uh, British political establishments who put him on trial at the same time as me. And he died of a massive heart attack two days before one of our court appearances. You took over as uh, chairman of the BNP in 1999, and is it fair to say you took the party through a professionalising and modernisation phase, and that to a degree was, was quite successful during the, the 2000s? Yes, that started a bit before then. I was working closely with, uh, with John before he was elected to lead the party. I think in 1997, uh, I wrote an article for his, the magazine I edited that he owned, Spearhead, uh, entitled No Time for Peter Pan, in which I said that the great stumbling block in a Britain which is now heavily multicultural, where lots of people have got black friends, black family members and so on, uh, is the idea of forced repatriation. And this has, if, we, if you're wanting to get anywhere politically, you have to move this to a voluntary basis. Uh, force goes up against so many things and against the British sense of fair play and uh, affection for the underdog, etc., etc. It simply is not is not saleable. Might have been when um, you know Powell produced it in 1968, but not by near the turn of the 2000s. And I argued this. I remember uh, John phoning me up halfway through the article, saying we can't possibly print this. So I said, Well, have you read the full article yet? And he read it and said, Oh, I see where you're going. And yes, I think we might be able to sell this, but I'm not sure. But we started this, and John actually agreed that yes, this was going to have to be done if we were going to make electoral headway, which was what the party's aim was. If it had been a movement saying, we're here to protect the rights of the indigenous Brits, to protect our history, etc., then you either don't need a policy on immigration and repatriation because it doesn't apply, or you can have it as fierce as you like. But when you want to get electoral power, you have to have something which is saleable to the masses. So I started getting my crypto across in 97. When I was elected in 99, we went full swing into that. Uh, and I made, we made a lot of efforts. It took a lot of selling. Some of the hardcore members never liked it, uh, but most got it, especially once we started to have success. So we softened the party's image, uh, professionalised it in every single way possible. And from 2002, we started to win elections, which and um, before that, the, uh, the British Union of Fascists had won one local council seat in its whole time, despite vast amounts of money poured in by Mosley and Mussolini and huge support. Uh, the National Front had never won a single seat. A splinter from it had won two seats. And within a couple of years, we'd won 40, 50, 60, and we're growing from there. So it was a remarkable thing, partly, I think, as a result of the fact that it was the moment at which huge numbers of the British working class in particular started to realise this is getting serious. This isn't just a few places. We've got a serious problem. And whenever we complain about it, the media attack us and smear us uh, and detest us. And at the same time, so that came into combination with the fact that for the first time there was a party talking about these issues which had made itself seriously electable. Another obstacle that uh, you and the BNP faced was the fact that uh, there is no free speech in the, the UK. And during the 90s, you were uh, uh, dragged before the, uh, the courts for an article uh, that you wrote uh, for the, the Rune under the, mm -hmm. the, the, the infamous uh, Public Order Act of the, the, the UK. Uh, and then there was a, another uh, legal trial you had to go through with uh, Mark Collette uh, when the, the BBC's secret agent uh, uh, episode uh, recorded uh, you and Mark at a, a private event. Yes, the, the first one, the room, I was actually the editor uh, and uh, my local MP complained to the police uh, and it duly became a court case. And that received very little publicity. It was covered only in the Daily Telegraph and Jewish Chronicle. The Daily Telegraph particularly tickled with the fact that I had a, a black nationalist uh, there to speak on my, on my side. And I defended myself. We had a great time in Harrow Crown Court uh, in London for, for a, two weeks. Uh, and I was found uh, guilty, but then effectively led off by the judge uh, with a suspended sentence. 
which was rather unforeseen. And then the second time around uh, was the big one, hugely publicised in Britain, worldwide actually to a degree. Um, and uh, this was two trials in Leeds Crown Court on a total of, I think it was on eight charges, no, 16 charges, sorry, 16 charges of incitement to uh, racial hatred, either deliberately or sort of accidentally. Uh, and as you say, it came about from a, a secret uh, piece of filming by the BBC. That's not to say that we were in some way caught out. It was, we were speaking at private events, which were still public meetings for anyone who had wanted to come. They weren't advertised as such because the left and the police would have stopped them. But they were open. There was local people there. Uh, said repeatedly, every single word that I said during that speech, or those speeches, it was several of them, uh, I would have said, had I known the BBC were there, because this was at the time when the, the grooming scandal uh, by uh, Muslim gangs of thousands upon thousands of young white girls was really starting to brew up. Uh, I was warning about this. This was 2004, these speeches that I made. Mark's speeches were mainly about the asylum seeker issue. I was hammering away saying that this grooming issue is a real problem. It's an absolute scandal. And of course, what the BBC showed was the most passionate bits of what I was talking about. This comes from the Quran, and when these people say repeatedly in the Quran that you can take those women which your right hand owns, that's the sword arm, that's the arm that you beat a white lad with a baseball bat with. I was speaking to a working class audience who knew exactly what I was talking about. The BBC showed those bits. They didn't show the parts of the speech when I was saying that the answer to this is not to hate these people or their community. Because yes, perhaps their community should speak out, but so should our community leaders. And what have our politicians, uh, our media people, our police chiefs done about it? Absolutely nothing. So the only way to deal with this issue is not to go out uh, attacking Muslims or something like that. It's to get involved in politics and to deal with the people who are really to blame, which is our elite, and then force them to do something. When the, the, the juries actually, of course, saw the full speech in context, that's how in the first one uh, we found not guilty on half the charges. Normally, the um, trial would have been dropped at that stage, but the Crown Prosecution Service immediately says, we'll have you back another time. Uh, and there we were dragged through the court yet again. In the end, it blew up in the face of the, of the British political elite. You said that in the 70s and 80s and so on, we didn't have free speech in Britain. It's true to a large degree. This trial in the, what was by this was 2006, 2007, by the time it came to court, it actually increased freedom of speech in Britain a great deal. Because after that, people realised that you could say pretty tough stuff about what was going on and you would not you would be found not guilty. And after that, the, the Crown Prosecution Service backed off a great deal. They suffered so badly through the publicity and then the disaster of losing that case that we got our freedom of speech back for, for some years. And it's one of the things, in a way, that, uh, that UKIP was able to build on. Uh, so it was a quite remarkable time. Very, very tough for my family. Uh, but uh, an, an immense part of our journey. Uh, I know you and Mark Collette were close in the, the 2000s. You've fallen out uh, now, but uh, in the in the early 2000s, Mark Collette was uh, at the centre of another media uh, BNP hit job with the, the Channel 4 program, Young, Nazi and Proud, where he was secret. Well, he wasn't... He, he, he was rec he knew sometimes when he was recorded but uh, then other times didn't know that the camera was on you uh, vouched for him uh, after that uh, what did that uh, episode teach teach you about the well you would have been already familiar with the, the media uh, uh, but uh, also uh, how 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 the party uh, was to to navigate and try to i guess break free of the, the fascist Nazi stereotype. It taught me that even the the very brightest, and Mark, you know, Mark was and is uh, very bright, uh, even the very brightest switched on and most cynical uh, youngster simply cannot cope with uh, something like a fly on the wall where someone's following them for weeks on end because their guard slips, they get careless, they get cocky, they want to show off or whatever it is. Something will go wrong. And whenever you're interviewed, even if it's a straight interview by these people, the only thing they show is your mistake. They don't show the good answers. They show the mistakes. Uh, and so they had hundreds of hours of, of footage of Mark. Some of it, as you say, he knew was being filmed. Some of it was secretly filmed. But he should have known it was secretly filmed. But there again, given his age, I shouldn't have put him there in the first place. So it taught me, as I say, that you never, we, we never after that did any fly on the wall documentaries. Nobody ever should. 
uh, with the exception we did one when I was being followed specifically in Barking in the, the big campaign there in the last main election we were in. And actually that came out very fair. But uh, I had by that stage an immense amount of experience uh, of handling these people. But generally without that, nobody should do these interviews. The media are only there to damage us. If you say anything which is good for us, they will not show it. What on earth is the point? Now, the, the BNP's rise in the 2000s, it, it peaked uh, with uh, not just yours, but yeah, the, the BNP won two uh, uh, seats in the, the European Parliament at the, the, the 2009 UK European Parliamentary elections. And that, I remember at the time, the, the, the far left in Britain, they really freaked out and they vowed to follow you uh, everywhere uh, 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 that you went uh, to, like, e even though you'd been democratically elected, that uh, your views were, uh, were not welcome. That uh, uh, that was the beginning of their, uh, it's peak now in 2020, their uh, activism of uh, harassment, uh, bullying and, and, and threats. And... Uh, following your election, you appeared on the, the BBC Question Time program, which is the equivalent of our ABC's Q&A program. And I assume that it's set up the same as our uh, Q&A program in that uh, the, produ or the team of producers, they, they set up uh, all the, the questioners beforehand with uh, their termed gotcha questions. And you... Uh, even though you were just one of many panelists, there was clearly the, the bullseye on you. And uh, they kept uh, trying to catch you out saying, oh, you, you, you have said this in the past. It's on YouTube. And you appeared on the defensive all the time. And a lot of people, uh, and Mark Coletta said this to, to me in another uh, interview, that a lot of people were uh, disappointed. What was your uh, point of view about how that went down? Well, I prepared for the question time by watching what they'd done when they had, for instance, Jerry Adams, uh, leader of Sinn Féin, stroke IRA uh, on, uh, and they asked him a couple of questions of, uh, in effect, have you stopped ordering people to be killed yet? Have you stopped telling people to plant bombs? Then after that, they moved on to discuss, you know, housing crisis and the banking problems and all the rest of it. So I slightly naively thought it would be the same. But I did, I've discussed this with a number of people beforehand, and I'd done in particular one interview some years before with a fellow called Tim Sebastian on um, Hard Talk, which ended up just, he was a very aggressive interviewer, it ended up just as a slanging match, because I stood toe-to-toe to 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 and went back on him. And it was a terrible piece of television, which we didn't come out of well, nor did he, it was awful. So we decided that I would go on and be defensive, because if I was offensive and... Um, uh, aggressive, it would indeed just be a most undignified slanging match. Uh, and the idea was that by being defensive, it would uh, activate the uh, the underdog, un un respect for the underdog uh, button that the British public have. Uh, and so when people now, especially the left immediately afterwards, they, they said, oh, Griffin was so hammered, he's been exposed, now he's going to collapse, now it's going to collapse. It's not true. Two, a year and a half after that, in the, uh, the general election, the British National Party beat UKIP in the majority of seats where we bid against them. We did better than them. Uh, so uh, it didn't have a bad effect. So the proof of the pudding is that despite the fact that I was beaten up on television, I was defensive and all the rest of it. Uh, in the period, all the period before that, the opinion polls had never had the British National Party on more than 6%. In the week after that, that figure went up to 22%. So when people are hostile to me, whether it's from the far left or now people from the far right with an axe to grind, when they're hostile and they say that was a disaster, it wasn't a disaster. It did exactly what it was supposed to do, even though it was painful. And the, the key thing after that is that uh, that was in 2009. And according to the BBC's rules of how many seats we had and what representation, uh, then I should have been on question time exactly the same number of times as Nigel Farage. In fact, I was on that once, which was a public lynching, and he was on 22 times. Uh, so what it actually shows, and from that moment, the BBC never put me on anything ever again unless they were forced by the law in an election to do so. So what the BBC actually saw, they put me on, and they spent the first half of the programme trying to establish that I was a fascist, which was where I was constantly under attack. In the second half, they let me speak actually quite freely 
about my views on Islam, my views on the uh, radical promotion of homosexuality, and my views of, on immigration. And what that was to do was to allow me, in my own words, to establish the fact that I was uh, a racist, a homophobe, an Islamophobe, which of course I dearly did. But what horrified them was that when they have no doubt had finished, they thought, well, that, that's the job done. When they saw the opinion polls afterwards, I found that nearly a quarter of the population was saying, yeah, what he said was right, or we agree with. That's what after that led to this complete clampdown on the BNP and the BBC's relentless and thoroughly obscene promotion of Nigel Farage. He wasn't just on Question Time. They put him on chat shows, on talk shows, on game shows, uh, on comedy programs. They put him all over the place because he was the acceptable face of opposition to immigration because the only immigration he was objecting to was actually white Christian immigration from Eastern Europe. And he wasn't against the immigration that the BBC loved. And he was put on to block the BNP. And that was an extremely successful thing. And that's the key reason the BNP declined and the, in the end collapsed. Uh, so uh, obviously the, the, the working class voters who, who voted for the, the BNP started voting for UKIP and, and Nigel Farage. And even though uh, they are work, work, working class, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Nigel Farage, he only uh, for the past decade focused exiting from the, the European Union, as you correctly said. He, he talked a lot about uh, Polish and Romanian uh, uh, immigration to the UK through the, the, the Schengen uh, area. I mean, uh, it's fair to say Nigel was uh, an elite. He, he was a, he was a banker, and uh, he ended up leaving UKIP when he one of his successors uh, as leader, Jared Batten, uh, hired Tommy Robinson as an informal uh, advisor. So, uh, so you uh, for their BNP's demise. Uh, the rise of UKIP, you believe, was a significant uh, factor, but obviously there was a significant amount of uh, infighting. You ended up being uh, expelled. You fell out uh, with uh, uh, Mark Collette. What uh, percentage of that do you think uh, contributed to its demise? Uh, well, when I, when I was finally expelled from the party, it was already effectively dead. Uh, so the demise was down to, to three things. The factor of UKIP being promoted by the BBC, etc., which we've already covered. Secondly, the uh, the equally artificial promotion of Tommy Ro Tommy Robinson and English, English Defence League, which I documented in a document. It's available online. Um, uh, what lies behind the EDL? I documented that from material that I found open source on the internet and proved absolutely conclusively in uh, in 2012 the extent to which uh, the EDL was literally a Zionist front. Uh, funded by neocons from the United States uh, and operated by them. Uh, and they had a variety of um, reasons for doing that, but undoubtedly one of them again was to block uh, the, uh, the BNP and it blocked us while UKIP was taking away, uh, was damaging the votes. The rise of the EDL took away uh, the main overwhelmingly working class foot soldiers and potential organisers, the people who would join sort of as populists, the sort of people that the EDL appealed to. And then once they've been in the party a while, uh, un came to understand more of genuine nationalist ideology, understand that the, com the problem is much more complex than just Muslim immigration, Islam and so on. Uh, and so the rise of the EDL cut us off from that constant source of new recruits. And all political parties, particularly radical ones under pressure, the members tend to have a shelf life. Activists tend to have a, you know, there's a churn. They're in, they're keen for two, three years, then they burn themselves out and drop out. So the EDL cut off that supply. And then the third factor was indeed the, the infighting. Uh, and there was a point at which literally every single meeting, we had 50 or 60 really active branches around the country, plus smaller ones. The 50 or 60 active branches holding a, a branch meeting every month where they sold the paper, which had just been delivered and so on. They had a guest speaker, things like this. And there was a point at which every single one of these 50 plus meetings every single month, the left had full reports of who was there and who said what up on their attack websites, even before we got the reports at head office. So there was an immense degree of infiltration. Uh, and at a certain point, or at certain points, of course, large numbers of these infiltrators uh, were, were triggered to take part in or even to inspire and kick off internal divisions 
it's one of the things that makes it particularly, I mean, frankly, impossibly hard to build any kind of effective nationalist election organization that you can think could come to power. Because to do that, you have to have some kind of open structure, some kind of democratic structure, and it is so open to infiltration and disruption that it's impossible to keep it going for too long. It seemed to me that when the, the English Defence League and Tommy Robinson started to rise in the, the early uh, t uh, 2010s, it seemed that they wanted to turn uh, t uh, t close the chapter on the, the British National Party's uh, history of associations with fascist skinheads and Nazis, and uh, they focus solely on uh, the Islam uh, issue, and uh, they, they 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 tried to promote what I called a a postmodernist uh, version of, of British nationalism. They tried to appeal to uh, blacks, uh, Indians, Jews, and uh, LGBT. Uh, people to say that we're uh, we're the true like liberal Democrats of the uh, uh, of the mm. UK. We're for everybody. We but we don't uh, support this ideology and religion which uh, has uh, this uh, t uh, t uh, totalitarian uh, tendency, and that had mass appeal, including to me as a as a young political. Uh, oh. whippersnapper but because they were street rallies and there were confrontations and a lot of them including well tommy uh he uh it, it, he is a, a football fan and had associations with football hooligans it still resulted in that same thuggish image it did yes um i would say that tommy just like nigel farage these people are not nationalists at all uh, Farage, as you say, he was a, a banker, a hyper-capitalist. Uh, I sat immediately behind UKIP's MEPs for five years and saw how they voted. Uh, and given any vote, if there was any kind of um, uh, clash of interests between the super rich and ordinary people, the people who voted for them, they always, without fail, took the side of the super rich. Uh, so they weren't nationalists, they were, global, they were uh, liberal conservatives. Uh, the sort of the, the Margaret Thatcher types, but w even without her social conservatism, uh, Tommy Robinson and co. Yeah, they are simply, as you say, liberals, pro multiculturalism, pro mass immigration, uh, pro uh, racial miscegenation, uh, with not a uh, no policy on anything else at all. They were liberals who hated and feared Islam, uh, generally for the wrong reasons. I mean, I as you, as you know, well, I've I've nearly been to prison twice for criticising Islam. But it wouldn't criticise Islam, for instance, for generally opposing abortion, for opposing usury, uh, for uh, believing in God and tradition. Absolutely not. Whereas they've opposed uh, Islam, yes, for the right reasons, but also for the wrong reasons, uh, and certainly not for nationalist reasons. But they were very effective at taking our support. It was all quite exciting, the, the football, football hooligan stuff and so on. Actually, if you've seen videos of Tommy fighting, he's never been much of a footballer, he couldn't fight his way out of a paper bag. But he's extremely brave, um, charismatic, and with immense backing of big money. But the real aim of those people, always from the very beginning, was not to, to save Britain. If you want to save Britain, you have to save the British people who built Britain for a start. So you have to address the question of immigration, miscegenation, culture, and all the rest of it. Their purpose in building that was to wind the white working class up into such a frenzy of hatred against all Muslims that they could persuade Britain to go to war against Iran. That was what the whole thing was about. It was part of a neocon Likud push to get Britain and the United States and other nations as well. It was an Australian Defence League run by exactly the same people. It was part of a push uh, when they got a horrible fright in the Iraq war, when they did what they wanted to do, but the middle class basically refused to give their taxes, or started to refuse to give their taxes, and the working class said, you're not having our sons and daughters. So when they wanted a new unjust, appalling war in the Middle East against Iran, this was part of the, uh, the operation to set that up to try to get all of us so fighting mad against Muslims that we'd happily go to war against Iran. Despite the, the modern optics of the English Defence League and Tommy Robinson, they, they still 
uh, ended up getting demonized by the, the media and, and politicians, uh, deplatformed from social media because obviously the, the 2010s was the big social media age. Tommy, or well, he's still on YouTube, but you can't find his channel, uh, banned from <coughs> Facebook and Twitter. If you, if you post Tommy Robinson's name on Facebook, uh, you, uh, you get a community standards uh, strike. And same with me, incidentally. Same with me. Uh, so it it clearly the, this uh, modernization strategy it it did it it didn't lead to political uh, political main mainstreaming the the demonization tactics by the media were the same, uh, but uh, the only person who or well, uh, face who's survived all of this is is Nigel Farage. Uh, uh, Brexit uh, has uh, now uh, occurred. They're, they're they're still the the twelve month post uh, negotiation, but uh, he's mm-hmm. still on all the. Well, he has he has uh, parted ways now with with LBC. He's starting to be a bit demonised uh, now, uh, but uh, he is he has been the the, the most successful, you, you would say, well, British sovereignty act, uh, yes. activist in terms of well getting Brexit through. Yeah, absolutely. So, and in that, uh, it's one of those very strange quirks of political fate. That we in the British National Party set out. We were always against the European Union. I was I was, I was active as a youngster and I was uh, just a teenager uh, in the referendum that we had about whether to stay in or leave the common market, which of course was the uh, the early uh, incarnation of the European Union. So we were always against it. Nigel Farage was pro the European Union uh, when he was in business as a young banker uh, until it he found out it hurt his business. And then he joined a very early UKIP and took it all from there. But UKIP was always very much a, a minor party, unknown and completely unsuccessful at all elections other than the European Parliament ones, which uniquely in Britain, or almost uniquely, uh, were based on proportional representation. There was always a big anti-EU bloc, and straight away Nigel was able to get in on that. But they were still very much a minority party and were going nowhere particularly. And I have no doubt that we would have stayed in the European Union but for this, as I've already said, in order to block the BNP, the BBC in particular, but certain other media elements, uh, in, uh, in, embarked on the most ridiculous promotion of Nigel Farage as the real but rather slick face of the right and opposed to immigration, but he's cleverer than Griffin and the BNP, blah, blah, blah. And that's what built UKIP into such a force uh, that uh, in the end became, in effect, a kingmaker in electoral terms. And the Tory party didn't dare to go head to head with it. They would have lost so many votes. Uh, and as a result, uh, Cameron gave the referendum that Farage was demanding, absolutely certain that the result of the referendum would be correct and the British would, uh, would vote to stay in. But without the BBC effort to stop the British National Party, Farage would never have been in a position to force that referendum. And we wouldn't have got a referendum. We would still be in the European Union. So it's actually a, it's a classic example of the law of unintended consequences and what happens if you in, in, engage in subverting the democratic process with very bad uh, bad aims, as the BBC did, these things blow up in your face. And certainly as a result of that, Farage, he is a very clever politician. He's also an extraordinarily lucky politician. Uh, and assuming we do actually finally get out of the European Union, uh, and they don't manage to use the uh, the COVID nonsense to, in the end, effectively block it. I think we will leave now. I think it's really more or less done and dusted. Farage will go down as probably the most effective politician in the end days of Britain as a nation, because we're going to be a sovereign state thing again, but we are never going to be Great Britain, and we are going to be cease to be, cease to be British. I'm afraid that is now the way things are going. But for the tail end politician, he is the great survivor and a great success. Let's talk about the, the current crisis that Britain finds itself in. You, you mentioned that in the, the early 2000s, you were highlighting the, the prevalence of, of these uh, grooming gangs, and it's probably the, the greatest scandal and, and cover-up in the, the 21st century in any Western country. So many mm-hmm. young girls uh, abused, having their, their lives ruined, and it was all covered up because of fear of local authorities and police seeming 
racist. A report has been written about it, but it's currently still suppressed. Yes, it was. You're absolutely right. I think it probably is the greatest concealed scandal. All the more so that it's actually only one third of the scandal. What's come out and talked about is only one third of the scandal. Because 12, 13, 14, 15 year old girls, normally, yeah, of course they're interested in boys. And normally the boys that they walk around with and run with uh, and form relationships with would be 16, 17, 18 year old boys of their own group. And the reason that there weren't those 17, 18 year old boys of their own group hanging around those girls as lads do in normal society is the fact that on the streets of those towns, if young white lads of 15 and 16 and 17 go out, they are intimidated, kicked around, beaten and occasionally stabbed to death by the same gangs. So for every girl who's been seduced and gang raped, there's a boy who's been intimidated and beaten. Hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of them. And no one's ever talked about that. And the other factor, of course, is that in both the case of demoralizing the, uh, the young lads uh, and uh, weakening the resistance of young girls, it's drugs, hard drugs, pushed by the same gangs. Uh, so, uh, again, for everyone that's come out who's had her life ruined by particularly uh, brutal rapes and all the rest of it, there's another one who's died of a heroin overdose. Uh, and so the whole thing is a scandal of monstrous proportions, and it is effectively a war against a whole generation of our, of our people. And the UK police, as, as well as uh, not uh, being timid when it comes to these grooming gangs, they're known worldwide now as the, the most politically correct uh, police force. Uh, they, they can't crack down on, on knife crime in, in London or uh, mm. acid attacks, which are also prevalent in London, uh, but they can uh, uh, knock down your, your, your front door if you said some mean words on the, the internet. And of course, the, the most, uh, uh, most infamous and ridiculous uh, uh, visits from the police if you've misgendered somebody uh, on the internet. Yes, absolutely so. I... I... I guess we're the worst, but I've seen some examples of pretty shocking politically correct policing uh, elsewhere in the world. I think there's perhaps something a bit special. You might have it in the US, in, in Australia, uh, because of the close cultural links. We got, had an organization uh, called Common Purpose, which is a, uh, a training program, and that's really to understate it. Uh, it's a sort of a, a, a molding machine for people within public service. Uh, it looks liberal. It's actually, I would say, effectively cultural Marxist. Uh, and Common Purpose uh, was, has been for a decade or more uh, heavily funded and heavily involved, provided, tr providing training for civil servants and especially rising police officers. Uh, and they've been molded. In turn, there was a time when most British police officers started as particularly tall, particularly tough working class lads, probably from a grammar school. Uh, but going into the police service at 18 and really finding out actually what it was like on the ground. And as a result, they came out pretty decent men. And once they were in charge of the police force in the area, uh, apart from the occasional bit of corruption and Freemasonry, etc., apart from that, they were pretty good. But in recent years, and really since Tony Blair's time, the 2000s, everybody in the police force, certainly everyone who's risen through the ranks, is university educated. And you don't go to university to join the police force and do an engineering degree because if you're doing an engineering degree, you're going to become an engineer. So these are all uh, graduates from the uh, from the classics and so on, from the soft uh, courses, from the journalism courses, from the sociology. And the course of that, they've gone three years of through three years of intensive brainwashing at university. And then that's topped up by the common purpose, uh, ultra ultra brainwashing. For, uh, for people being fast-tracked to run society. So these are now the people running the police force. Uh, it used to be said that you couldn't get on in the police force unless you were white and a Freemason. For years now, we have uh, early retired policemen and even serving police officers who joined very quietly. And for 15 years ago plus, we started to be told it used to be white and Freemasonry was the way forward. Now you will not get past inspector unless you are homosexual or Muslim or Marxist. And that's what we now got running the show.
And on top of that, now virtually all the young cops, there's none who are this old, tough, tall working class. They're all of them graduates from this same school. So the police force has been completely transformed. And there's a degree to which they're cowardice when they won't confront uh, a, a, an Islamist mob uh, doing something particularly bad because they know this could easily result in a 10 million pound riot on their watch. Uh, so they don't want that. So there's a degree of cowardice. Uh, but more than that, their brains and their hearts are already hell bent on surrender to these forces in the first place. And we've seen the peak of such policing during uh, the UK's national lockdown, which uh, I mentioned that native Brits uh, were under house arrest, but uh, the international borders remained open. In Australia, we uh, only Australian citizens and residents are allowed in now, and there's a mandatory 14-day isolation uh, where you're uh, cooped up in a, in a hotel, not allowed to, to leave. But in the UK, you can arrive in, in Heathrow, you're just told by the authorities to self-isolate and you can just uh, ignore them. And uh, the UK had some of the worst uh, uh, snitches, uh, I, I, I think, mm -hmm. in the, the Western world. And uh, of course, the uh, police officers harassing people in their front yards or patrolling uh, apartment blocks, uh, basically because it's easy. Uh, it's tough to uh, 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 to uh, go after gangs or, or knife crime, something that uh, might uh, get, uh, cause you or uh, others harm. It's it's easy to yeah. harass uh, native compliant Brits. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, at the start of this, for the first couple of weeks, I wasn't sure what was going on with this. I thought well, yeah, perhaps it really is serious. But by the tail end of March. Uh, there was enough data in around the world for it to be very clear that COVID was actually, it's wrong to call it a flu because it's more like a cold virus, but it's a cold virus with a, uh, uh, a casualty rate similar to a fairly nasty flu. And that's it. Uh, and it's certainly, a, and if it affects people w worse nowadays, it's because as a society, the Western world in particular, uh, is, uh, tends to be thoroughly obese, thoroughly unhealthy. And we have large numbers of uh, non-whites in the northern hemisphere who are not getting enough vitamin D through their dark skins, who are therefore particularly vulnerable to coronavirus. So serious efforts needed to be needed to be made, not to bring it under control, but to protect the people who are vulnerable and to let it rip through society because the sooner we all had it, the sooner it would go away. That's what needed to be done. And uh, it was also very clear by, say, roughly I say, the beginning of April, that the elites in this are either so grotesquely incompetent in what they're doing with these lockdowns and all their insane ways of treating it, particularly, for instance, saying to people, stay inside when vitamin D is one of the best defences against this disease, however healthy or unhealthy you may be. So it became clear that these the elites running the whole show are either grotesquely incompetent or were doing this for malicious reasons uh, in order to create a crisis to cover their own financial crisis, which I think is part of it, the inevitable collapse of the, of the, the post-2008 debt economy of the Western world has been covered up. We're going to get the collapse, but people will blame the coronavirus instead of blaming the banking system and the political and media elites. Uh, and of course, there's also the question of the power grab. And even if uh, governments didn't start off thinking this is an opportunity to get extra power and surveillance and so on, now it's rolling, they very obviously see it and have taken it as an as an opportunity to take power. So when I worked this out uh, very start of April, I put a challenge out on the internet uh, to all the other nationalist leaders in Britain, and I named specifically uh, Nigel Farage, Tommy Robinson, Mark Collett, Paul Golding, all of them. Uh, obviously, Nigel Farage is streets ahead of all of those in terms of recognition and power, but it's relevant for, any, for everybody. And I said, this thing is a farce and a danger to our people. You, all of you need to come out and do what I'm doing. I'm promoting the hashtag lockdown rebellion and saying to people, simply ignore this. We have to break this or it's going to break us. And uh, still to this day, out of all uh, Britain's voices just about still online, etc., from the whole nationalist scene right away across its board, from its most liberal through to its most extreme, there's only me and Jada Franson. We are the only ones who call this for what it is and continue to do so. Uh, and although you know, I, we continue to call for people to ignore this, it's patently obvious that actually the British public are sufficiently cowed 
uh, all sufficiently fooled that they're not going to react against this. I don't even think they'll react when we get a second wave lockdown. Uh, I think this monstrosity is the new normal. And I suspect we'll talk about Black Lives Matter in a bit. But with the Black Lives Matter attack uh, on our heritage and our right to feel proud of our past and so on, and this, they have literally overturned our world in the last three months. I also, before we get on to Black Lives Matter, I want to talk about what's uh, been called, what's developed uh, during the uh, coronavirus pandemic in the UK, the cult of the the NHS, the, the National yeah. Health Service. And uh, there's a lot of now migrant uh, NHS workers. And there was that, I would call it taunting uh, video by migrant NHS workers saying, you clap for me now because they're... Uh, workers in the NHS, their neighbours apparently came out and, and, and clapped them, basically taunting, oh, you used to discriminate against us, now uh, we take care of you, uh, be grateful and, and, and suck it up. And of course, the, the media reports were the hospitals were overwhelmed and nurses were working overtime, but I've lost count of how many of uh, th those well, TikTok, that uh, uh, Chinese-owned yeah. video app, all those NHS nurses doing all those choreographed uh, TikTok dances, which of course shows that they've got no work because they've sent uh, people getting cancer treatment home. And it was it, it, it just, just looked insulting and disgusting. It certainly was. Now, uh, my wife and other family members are nurses, so I know exactly uh, how uh, nurses have seen this and what they've been through and so on. And yes, again, there was a little bit of concern right at the start, and very early on they were saying there's something wrong here, more and more and more of them. Uh, and the average British nurse, and the idea that the British Health Service is run by immigrants, it's a nonsense. Uh, our care homes are largely staffed by East Europeans and Filipinos. To a, you know, to a fair degree, that's true. Uh, but actually nurses, and there's quite a lot of doctors who are particularly Asians. But in the health service, yes, if you see uh, an immigrant worker, they're almost certainly one of the cleaners. And the health service, the backbone of the health service is middle-aged nurses, white nurses who've been there for 20, 30 years and coming to the end of their retirement, coming to retirement, they're the real backbone of the health service. Anyway, and they certainly weren't TikToking. Their position right from the start has been this is all patronizing bullshit. And that if you want to thank us, then how about a pay rise which is above inflation? Because for the last 15 years, we've had pay rises below inflation. So for all that the elite claim to value us, they've been cutting our wages for the last 15 years. And that's the reality of it. But as you say, it has been a cult of the NHS. Uh, and again, brilliantly, brilliantly put. And you have to say that whatever the motivation for it, the coordinated propaganda campaign that the liberal elite have run over this exceeds in brilliance and power anything that any regime has ever done anywhere in the world. You talk to people, uh, say, in the old Soviet Union, and they all will tell you, that, yeah, we didn't believe that propaganda once we were past our early teenage years. We didn't believe it. We went along with it because it was too dangerous not to. But in this case, one third of the population of Britain, without a shadow of a doubt, and I'm sure it's the same in most other countries, at least one third of the population believe it. Another third think there's enough in it that they've got to accept this. And the other third are so frightened by the power of this thing that they're not prepared to speak about it, let alone, talk, let alone oppose it. You mentioned the, the the hashtag lockdown rebellion. It turned out it was what I termed the the lockdown lovies, uh, the the far left neo Marxists. They decided to to do the lockdown rebellion, uh, imita or importing the the Black Lives Matter uh, movement or uh, the or the the new extreme version from the United States, triggered by the the death of uh, uh, George Floyd and. They uh, rallied in, in London, not practicing social distancing, and then, of course, moved on to the, the, the statues. And yeah. it was, uh, I remember in one of Paul Joseph Watson's uh, videos, he, the, uh, the, the, the lunacy of a British uh, Black Lives Matter about UK police brutality. There was only one black man who'd been shot dead by police in the UK the past year, and that was the London Bridge terror attacker. <laughs> Yes, abso absolutely so. Absolutely so. Um, I don't really think there's anything I can 
add to that, you've, you, you summed it up perfectly. Uh, the thing is insane. Even in the United States, uh, if you actually look at the figures, yes, some innocent black people have been killed by the police. So are far more innocent white people because there's an element to which the American police, the whole American justice system is part privatized and particularly brutal. Uh, and you don't really want to mess with the American police. Uh, and given that George Floyd was out of his mind on various different drug, drugs, uh, a very powerful man uh, and with a very nasty record, it's really not surprising, actually, that the police were fairly frightened of him uh, and therefore were fairly foolish how they handled him. But you're right that to apply the, or tr to try to claim that what's gone on in America, even if you took it at face value, has also happened in Britain, it is farcical. So from that, you obviously have to understand that uh, this uh, Black Lives Matter operation in Britain is not some organic thing, grassroots thing, natural thing. Uh, it's deliberately stirred up by extremely well-funded forces. And again, coming back to Black Lives Matter, whether in Britain or America, if you can actually do a little bit of research online, you very rapidly come to understand that you're dealing with a multi-million dollar industry financed not by George Soros, not just by George Soros, who of course is the bet noir of the entire right. Yes, Soros and the Open Society Foundation have funded it, but also uh, the Ford Foundation, the Kellogg Foundation, big capitalism is there right at the heart of promoting this uh, rebellion and attempted revolution against the society in which theoretically uh, you know, big capitalism is, central, is a central part. These statues that uh, I've lost count of how many uh, statues they 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 are demanding uh, be taken down or they have taken upon themselves to to take down. Uh, obviously, uh, I know who Winston Churchill and Cecil Rhodes are, and they were not uh, bad historical men. You know your your British history based on the statues that they want want to to take down. Are there are there some? some statues that are up uh, that are of historically bad people or what's what's your because well, it's so hard to actually get a a good historical assessment yeah well in the case of the slave traders uh, and these sort of 18th uh, century magnates who are, who are dotted around various of our cities you know the, the men who paid to build the town hall or the library or whatever uh yeah some of them do deserve to be taken down not i would say for their role in slavery but because particularly when they were bought out and they sold, uh, they were re reimbursed uh, and compensated for the loss of their slaves, they piled into the latter stages of the enclosure movement in which they used their power in the House of Commons to literally steal vast tracts of land, the common lands, from the British people. You know, everyone knows about, especially in Australia, people know about the, you know, the famine and the clearances of Ireland and about the clearances of Scotland of the Highlands. But before that, there was also the clearance, clearances of lowland Scotland and also the theft and clearances of the English uh, peasantry from our lands as well. So many of those men were involved in the, the largest whole scale theft there has ever been since the conquest of 1066. Uh, and so if British nationalists, and especially English nationalists, wanted to take them down, that would be legitimate. But when you've got foreigners and outsiders wanting to take them down as part of a broader campaign to demonize the whole of our history, this is a monstrously dangerous attack, actually, on British identity, on British culture, and on the potential cohesion of the British people. So, for instance, in my nearby hometown of Shrewsbury, uh, there's a statue of Robert Clive, who was Clive of India, who uh, effectively conquered India for the British. Uh, and was accused of, or has been accused recently. He was a hero for a century or more. He's now accused of having enriched himself and caused the Bengal famine and such things. Uh, so he's now a target. Uh, and when there was a far left mob promising to turn up and remove him a couple of weeks ago, uh, I turned up there and there was 50 local chaps, quite a lot of young football fans and so on. And the left took one look at us and disappeared. So, uh, yeah, some of the figures are... Uh, men from our history who we should absolutely revere and some of them are people ranging from some of the slave owners uh, and the thieves of our common lands through to Winston Churchill Bomber Harris. There's an argument that those men were war criminals and mass murderers so you could have a debate about whether their statues should be there but you cannot have mobs of any description let alone foreign mobs uh, funded by uh, thoroughgoing Marxist subversives. You cannot have them take down 
your statues dismantle your culture without paying a price in due course, which goes way beyond the mere loss of a few statues. Uh, the first uh, Islamic terror attack in in the UK uh, in the uh, the pandemic uh, occurred. Uh, uh, just a, a few days ago, the the, the Reading uh, stabbing terror attack, which it was clear earlier on earlier on that it was a, a terror attack, and I was surprised that the UK police they actually confessed in the end uh, that it was a, a terror attack. I noticed. I, oh, I've got Wikipedia out here. They just call it the 2024 Brig Gardens stabbings. They don't call it a, a terror attack, but this. It's just it repeats all the time. I, t I talked about the the London Bridge attack last year. That was the second one, and nothing happened after the the Manchester Arena uh, bombing, where uh, British girls were uh, were were, were blow, blown up. Yeah, there's a, a number of factors coming into it. Uh, the attacker in this one. Well, first of all, the question uh, was it a te Why are they saying it's a terror attack? I think that's going going to become clear because he clears to have deliberately targeted a group of homosexuals. So this is homophobia. Um, so uh, therefore they'll admit that that's a terror attack because very readily, because the victims aren't ordinary white Brits. Uh, in the case of uh, the Manchester bombing, they had to admit that was a terror attack because when, when you're going into a place with a, with a, a large bomb, you know, it most definitely is terrorism. The factor, of course, they won't, haven't talked about in either of these cases, but particularly the Manchester bombing, was the guilt, and I use the word directly, the guilt of David Cameron, former British Prime Minister, because it was Cameron with Sarkozy and Clinton who destroyed Libya uh, with the, uh, the bombing in 2011, 2012. They destroyed Libya, got Gaddafi, who was a secular dictator, uh, who was running a very effective, decent country with a decent standard of living and uh, crushing any Islamists who raised their heads. And they replaced him with a howling wilderness of Islamic extremism. They used, in particular from Manchester, and both obviously the Manchester bomber, but also this latest attacker was part of the Libyan community in Manchester for most of his time here. There's 10,000 Libyans, Libyans in Manchester. And the vast majority of them came to Britain as Islamist political stroke terror refugees in the time of Gaddafi. And when the time came to overthrow Gaddafi, the British government, the secret services and so on, gave those people the green light to travel back to Libya and supported them and then used the Royal Air Force to bomb Libyan uh, forces fighting them. So they gave those monsters control of Libya. So this is blowback. It's just the same as 9-11 and the Saudis and the Taliban and so on. Uh, this is simply blowback. This is our elite seeking to use Islamist extremists as, as foreign policy weapons in the Middle East, whether it's against uh, Libya or Syria or Iran or whatever, seeking to use them, hoping that they won't get burnt with a blowback. And of course, very frequently, the political elite don't get caught with a blowback because they're protected by armed guards and all the rest of it, and they live in nice posh places. The people who get caught in the blowback are the ordinary Brits, like the ones uh, in Manchester or in that park in Reading. Britain's been through all uh, these horrors, not just the terror attacks, but the the, the ones that I mentioned before, the, the, the past 10 years under a supposed uh, conservative uh, government. Uh, this uh, lockdown, which has discriminated against the native Britons, that's been implemented by conservative government. Uh, Boris Johnson is considered to, to be the, the most conservative of the, the three conservative prime ministers you've had of the the past decade and as the old argument goes uh, what is, exactly is he conserving he may say some politically incorrect stuff from from time to time but uh, he's not really reversing any trends and the conservative party is always going to be one of the two major parties they have shunned nationalist activists all throughout uh, the yeah. years yes indeed I mean, but boris Yes, he calls himself a conservative. If you actually look at uh, what he says and what he does, he's uh, overtly and overly proud of uh, the foreign bits of his ancestry. I mean, lots of people have got some foreign ancestry. It's not a problem. But most uh, in the in the BNP and the NF before us, uh, before that, we used to have people whose grandparents were Poles or Greek or whatever or uh, uh, some, something similar. Uh, and many of those were the most proudly 
firmly, solidly British of anybody, you know, there's perhaps a, a little bit of a reaction against it. Whereas Johnson has always gone out of his way uh, to express his pride in his Turkish, Muslim and Jewish ancestry. Uh, and uh, to say he'll, you know, basically he'll stand up for those things, those values. And the values he stands for, and the modern Conservative Party stands for, are values which in the 19th century certainly were recognised as the values of the Liberal Party. And are nowadays, a, it's, it's a hybrid between neoconservatism, the right wing of the, of the Tory party is neoconservative, and therefore traitors to Britain on behalf of the United States and Israel, and the left wing of the Conservative Party are neoliberal, and therefore traitors to Britain and the British interests on behalf of global capitalism. Uh, so it's a monstrous. Really, the Conservative Party should be convicted under the Trades Descriptions Act for using that term. But it does it and it's very effective and the people remain fooled. And now and Johnson's popularity has absolutely tanked in the last three months, partly justifiably and partly because uh, the leftist media have been on his back over every single death with coronavirus. Uh, and so his popularity has tanked. The Labour Party have got rid of their completely unelectable, not least because the British mass media so hated Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and they've now got a sort of um, uh, Tony Blair clone. And it's already quite clear the next election will see Britain go back. It's a pendulum, this thing between Conservative, Labour, Conservative, Labour and a pendulum. Pendulums are used by hypnotists to hypnotise the people watching the pendulum. And that's precisely what the two party system does in every single country where we have it. It hypnotizes the people. They believe they have a choice, but they believe the choice they and others make matters. And they watch this thing as our civilization goes down the tubes. And the pendulum is now swinging back to the Labour Party, which will make an even bigger hash of it than the Tories will. And then in due course, it will swing back to the Conservative Party as the old Britain vanishes. Well, I've appreciated you, Nick, sharing your experience and perspective on, on Wilms Front tonight. I, I know that uh, uh, these days uh, you or you, you have the role of an elder state, statesman passing passing on uh, your uh, advice to the, the, the next uh, generation of nationalists, the uh, Generation Z or Zoomers, uh, uh, as they've called, people can still find you on Twitter for now. I noticed you have a, a blue check mark. How did you get that? <laughs> I, I've had it quite some time, actually. I can't really remember. I had to send them various documents. I think it would have been extremely hard, even for Twitter liberals, to have denied that Nick Griffin was Nick Griffin. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I got that. How I've still got it, how I'm still on Twitter, I don't know. So, as you, as you mentioned before, please follow me on Telegram. I've just joined Parler as well. Please follow me on there because uh, I am not retired. I spent several years looking at what the hell's going on here. People have said to me, look, Nick, form a new party. We're ready to join you, all the rest of it. And yes, I could form a new party. And I could say, join us, vote for us, give us your money, and we'll sort everything out. That would be a lie. So I haven't been able to do it because this situation that Western civilization is in now is past sorting out. Not going to sort out. We are going to go through a collapse. But that does not mean that you have to take you know, a black pill, you may as well take a sign head pill, it's all over. The thing that's been killing our people is liberalism. And liberalism is not going to survive the partly structural and partly imposed collapse of global debt, capitalist consumerism, call it what you will. Liberalism won't survive. And those of our people who make the right choices, choices, starting with personal choices to get away from ground zero. If you live near Reading and you go to the park, you must expect to get stabbed because Reading is a multi-cult hellhole. So if you go to the park in Reading, well, either you don't go, you move away from Reading if you possibly can, and go to a park which is still our people. And I'm sure this is still the same in Sydney, just as in Los Angeles and New York. You have to make this choice. You either stay near the area which is going to be deadly for people like us, or you go away. Or if you have no choice but to go to the park, at least take a heavy walking stick. Because if one person had taken a heavy walking stick to that park in Reading, they would knock the knife out of that knife one's hand, battered into the ground, and that would have been it. They would then probably have been uh, put in prison for racially aggravated assault, etc., etc., for defending our kind, but he wouldn't have stabbed three people to death and stabbed others. So people have to make the first choice is to, if you possibly can, get away from it, and then to have lots of children, because it's a, dem a demographic issue. We are not having enough children. But not just have children, because you also have to make sure that children are reared like us. So my key advice to, generation, to, to the Zoomers is yes, get married, have kids, but above all else, 
homeschool them and turn off the television. People have to start making those choices. And then as this all collapses, um, when any time a civil all civilizations collapse, every time a civilization collapses, there are survivors. And the people who survive are those who band together, who work together, who become as self-sufficient as they are. So there's many, many things to do to ensure that the core, the kernel of our civilization, our culture and our DNA goes through what is going to be a bottleneck. So there's plenty to be done. Now I've worked this out and so on and what we can be doing and the very many positive things, fun things, far easier things than trying to fight elections and losing all the time. It's very painful banging your head against a brick wall for decades. Uh, now I've worked that out on the final stages of writing I hope a definitive book about where we go from here. So all your listeners, please come follow me on Twitter while I'm still there, Telegram, Parler, and so on. Keep in touch. I'd love to be back with you in due course as well, Tim. In the meantime, thanks for the platform and um, best of luck this evening to all in Australia. Keep safe out there. Yes, we, we definitely uh, uh, can't have enough words, uh, words of warning from people such as yourself in, in Britain. So it's much appreciated. Thanks a lot. Cheerio. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.